So uh, let me uh, well, let me give you my uh, my story. And if you want to bear with me, if you got any questions, you can call me knucklehead, whatever you want. I don't take myself that seriously. I really don't. Uh, September tenth, nineteen ninety four was my day to live in infamy. Uh, I went from being a number third highest recruited linebacker in the entire nation with bad grades, and uh, being on the bench press four hundred and thirty pounds to zero in a single second. Now, for me. That was unacceptable to become paralyzed and set that for the rest of my life that I'd be confined to a wheelchair. My whole life had been physical movement. I had been captain of every single team I'd ever been on, football, baseball, basketball, swimming, soccer, you name it. My whole life was movement. I was, I was going to be an NFL player, no doubt. And people in the NFL now are weaker, not as strong, or as able as I was at 19. You know, I bench pressed 430 twice, squatted 625 five, five times. Ran four or fives in shorts and jeans. Uh, it, it was what I gave my life to. My father was the uh, r champion of New York, New Jersey, and Delaware. I'm sorry, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, and a heavyweight weightlifter. He taught me from the age of six on how to discipline yourself, dedicate yourself, go after your goal. And whatever it is, that goal, you accomplish it or you go on another goal. For me, my goal is the NFL. I was destined to it, no problem. I guaranteed it was easy. But on September 10, 1994, my whole existence changed. I went from being able to do everything to nothing, to be able to do this in a single second. Doctor came in my room three days after the fact and said, Roman, um, you'll never move your arms, you'll never move your legs, you'll never father a child. I said, F you, get out of my room. I didn't accept that then, I don't accept that now. I've been wrong about when I will walk, I will not be wrong about the fact that I will walk again, and so will so many of us. 1.275 million is my goal. No, we won't get everyone, but we're gonna try. That's my goal. So what do we do? Three days after the fact, I remember being very aware of a choice that I could either take the wrong road and almost justifiably, and you know, take some painkillers or meds, and you know, just kind of, just kind of accept it and kind of fade away. Or I could do something about it. For me, there was no choice. It's hard for me to get through it, let alone a child. How, how do you look at a child and say? Good luck and look away. You don't. You can't call yourself a, a man or a woman. When you see paralysis firsthand, you experience it when you live it. When every day I talk to people who are paralyzed, new, newly paralyzed, been paralyzed a long time, people who have given up hope. I know 12 people right now, I can name names, who have committed suicide because they couldn't take it anymore. How do I look away? Do we look away? We're all here together looking together. We're all here together. We all came from different places together because we're not looking away. And that is what's going to cause paralysis cure. So how do we get to this point? Well, first off, my dad and I uh, went to Stanford and we went to the medical building and we looked up spinal cord injury and there's all these books and we spent about 300 bucks and we bought all these books and we went down and we were, we were determined we are going to find a cure and read it and read it and looked at each other like, oh my God, what is this? Is this English? What is this? We, it, was, it became very apparent that I would never be the scientist who would find the cure, but it became very apparent that we had to fund the scientists who would find the cure. That we had to fund the Oz Stewart's, the Hans Kirstads, the Mark Tuzinski's, the Jerry Silver's of the world. I believe in sayings. I believe in cliches. The squeakiest wheel gets the most oil. What if I didn't squeak? What if we all didn't squeak? What if we just sat there and accepted it and quiet? We looked away. You have to advocate, you have to get in front of people, and you have to move them, and you have to tell them, and you have to ask them. There's a story in Minnesota where there's a longtime friend, a politician, and the politician uh, counted on his buddy, we'll call him Bob's vote, and all of a sudden, the next day it came, and the, the politician had lost a vote, and he asked Bob, you know, I, I thought I was going to win, everyone was going to vote for me, I mean, you voted for me, everyone, and Bob's like, hey, I didn't vote for you. Why not? Because you didn't ask. You have to ask. How can you expect to get anything if you don't go and ask the legislature for money, if you don't go ask a donor for money, if you don't go and agitate for paralysis cure? You have to stand up and you have to be willing to fail. Now I've failed three times now on passing my law in California, but I've passed it three times successfully. We've given away 15 million and we've leveraged on another 89 million on top of that. We're over $100 million because we asked, because we stand up, because we agitated, because the squeakiest wheel gets the most oil. 
So that's what we did. We built a coalition from grassroots up. The first time we did it, great people like Karen Miner and Susan Rachi and my, my father is the most amazing, hardest worker I could ever imagine. We had a grassroots budget of, get this, a grassroots tire budget, zero dollars. And we passed the Roman Reed Law. We didn't have resources of funding, we had resources of willpower. Our horsepower was our energy, our spirit, our will to do whatever we had to do. If we needed a photographer, well then we talked to someone, we twisted their arm and they did it pro bono. If we needed a graphic designer, we talked to someone, they twisted their arm and they did it pro bono. We established this entire grassroots amazing effort, so strong to the point that a Norman, Storman Norman Schwarzkopf was our first celebrity and he, he endorsed us and said, this is probably the most important thing that I can think of. This is a guy who just won the first Gulf War, this mountain of a man. And you, he's looking and said, he's proud of me. I, 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 it was humbling. We had the, my hero is Christopher Reeve. We had Christopher Reeve. He came in, uh, and I'm sorry, he, he testified for us. And it was through a conference and it was on a phone and, at UC Irvine. And it was on a phone. And people were so excited that Christopher Reeve was testifying for us that they were snapping pictures of a telephone, of a telephone. It wasn't Christopher, it was just a telephone. But Christopher cared. Christopher literally worked himself to death. He cared so much. He had a pressure sore, a decubitus ulcer, and if he could lay down his stomach for six months, done nothing, it would have healed himself, and Superman would have been allowed to, Superman would have lived. But no, he didn't accept that. He had to push forward. We have to push forward. It's incumbent upon us to stop this paralysis in this generation. We cannot accept future generations how to suffer what we suffer. The first history, the first mention of paralysis in the history of the entire world is written inside the walls of an Egyptian tomb, and it reads, deny the paralyzed soldiers water. Water, for there is nothing that can be done. And for too long that was the truth. No more, not any longer. There's too much that we can do, that we should do and that we will do. We will all be able to seize the day, carpe diem, when we can bend down and pick up our child or close our hand on our wife. These are things that we take for granted, but these are things that we must all fight for, to squeak for, that we squeak for. What would you do if you had the lottery numbers in front of you, but it was very hard to get to that place where you turn them in? Would you turn your back and say, that's too hard? Or would you go through hell or high water to find a way? Well, I believe we have those lottery numbers. I believe it's stem cells. I believe we know who those lottery winners are. I believe some of them are sitting here today in this room. And I know that we know how to do it. Cures come from research, and research comes from funding. I've given my life to fund it. We have to agitate, we have to promote, we have to create awareness. And you have to tell people and make them understand. Because once you understand, embryonic stem cell research, in my mind, there's no controversy. You have to be against IVF, you have to be against even organ donor trans transfers if you're against embryonic stem cell research. When a woman and a man go to, embryonic, go to the IVF clinic, usually they take 10 eggs, fertilize them. Hopefully they're successful in the first five tries. What do you do with the other five? You put them into a freezer and then you let discard them as medical waste. Why not break those open? Use the lining of those embryonic stem cells and cure Parkinson's, spinal cord injury, and SMA. If you could ask me who, if I had a cure, not for just different diseases, but just my personal cure, or if I would give it to someone named Gwendolyn Strong. Strong, that's her name, and she's the strongest woman I've ever met. She's four years old, and I do get choked up when I speak with her, because she's four years old, and she will die before she's six, because she's 99% perfect, and not one last per percent perfect, and that will kill her. Amino acids, how proteins, how you make muscles, and how I got strong, how we all get strong, how we move our muscles is amino acids work in chains. If you have 100 units of A, 100 units of B, and one of C, you only have one unit. They work in chains, they work together. Well, she has one bioreceptor that won't go out and grab that one lousy amino acid in her blood system and make those chains of protein and make the muscle. So Gwendolyn Strong will never be able to swallow a, a glass of orange juice or play soccer. But she lives and she goes to preschool and she can make these little grunting sounds, and when she's really excited, she moves her finger. And I went to her hospital the first time, and at first I was overwhelmingly, profoundly sad. 
I felt, felt like a, I felt like a loser, like I hadn't done enough to be able to get a cure. And halfway through, my, everything changed. She profoundly affected me, made me a better person. How can you say no to Winland Strong? How can you say no to not doing everything you can instead of sitting on a couch and you know, watching one more McDonald's commercial and being lazy instead? Give that extra money to, to research. Give that extra money to people who need it. In 2009, if you even don't care about Gwendolyn Strong because she's an awesome, wonderful person and normative social issues, you better care about our country and a fiscal reason. In 2009, as corporate and personal income taxes, we brought all together as 1.6 trillion to take care of people like me. And I know I'm not on government rules, but for now one year alone, it costs 1.65 trillion. We will go bankrupt as a nation if we don't find cures. For pennies on a dollar, we can solve these health care issues. The 20-80% rule, 20% of the most injured in all of America, take 80% of the health care costs. Just cure us. Get us out of these chairs. We don't want to take 80% of the health care costs. We want to go back to work. We want to rise up again. We want to stand up together. We want to pay taxes because we're working. We don't want to live in chairs or live on a bed, hospital bed waiting for that fatal day. So that's why we all are here to agitate together. So I ask you all, and I thank you all, for what you've done to this point. And I ask you from further to take a stand for the research, to take a stand for the cure, for the suffering, to take a stand so one day everybody can. Thank you.